Do you work out in the morning? Work out in the morning? Yeah, and every day, 6.30 or 7 a.m. That's you or that's yeah, me? That's me, every that's day, every yeah. day. Yeah. Six days a week. And I eat like crazy. I eat probably seven meals a day. Just, just grazing, 24, just, just 24 seven non-stop grazing. Non-stop eating, yeah. I can't eat enough. <laughs> if I have like three meals a day, I lose a lot of weight, especially with travel and work and everything. It's like most people get fat, I just, get, I lose, I just drop muscle, weight, everything. Yeah, sweet. Nice problem to have. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastien Couture. Today we have yet another interview from the Ethereum Community Conference, which took place in Paris in early March. So today I bring you my conversation with Jason Goldberg, CEO of Pepo and OST, and James Dyer, head of product at Decrypt. Now, if you hadn't figured it out already, Pepo is one of our sponsors, and I'm pretty active on the platform. And we actually partnered with them at the Ethereum Community Conference to put together this amazing podcast studio. And so if I'm able to bring you all this content from the conference, it's in large part thanks to them. And we do have quite a bit of content coming up in the next little while. Now, this was a really fascinating conversation because we discussed something that I'm deeply interested in, and that is new monetization models in media. And the reason why we had Jason and James on together is because Decrypt was announcing a new app that they've built on OST technologies. And with this new app that leverages OST, readers of Decrypt will be able to earn tokens for reading content and interacting on the site. Now, these ideas have been around for a long time, even in the early days of Epicenter on the LTB network. Longtime listeners will remember the LTB token and the magic word and the proof of listen and all these incentives to listen to the podcast. But they've never really been executed very well. And so I'm really interested to see the interesting things that Decrypt will be doing with this app. And so with that, let's go straight to the interview. I'm here with Jason Goldberg, who's the CEO of OST and Pepo, 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 Pepo. As we- long as you're saying it, it's fine. <laughs> and James Dyer, who's the co-founder at Decrypt. And Decrypt is a media property or media company. Um, but I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourselves in more in more detail. Um, yeah, please introduce yourselves and, and let our, our audience know how they how you got involved in crypto. Sure. So Jason Goldberg and I've been a serial entrepreneur for over 20 years. Uh, the first product that I worked on was AOL chat rooms back in 1990s. Uh, I've been working in community and internet for a long time. Uh, I fell down the crypto rap- rabbit hole in 2016 uh, when I was working on an app that I had launched called Peepo, uh, which was, uh, we had this novel idea back in 2016 to enable influencers to earn money directly from sponsors, advertisers, fans, without going through platforms. And, and it's been great. And realized back in 2016 that that would be a really hard thing to do. Um, so we'd have to build a ton of technology to do so. And so that led us to building OST, Open Symbol Token. So, so the idea for Peppo came before? We had an app. Oh, yeah, it, was, okay. it was first Peepo. I'm like literally the app was Pepo way before OST, before okay. Simple Token. Okay. OST stands for Open Simple Token. Right. Um, and yeah, we launched an app in 2016. It was basically any influencer could create their own channel in the app. Uh, we had t- lots of foodies, travel bloggers. Uh, people could join their channels. Uh, the idea was to build up kind of the like the Web2 experience, like messaging to the influencers, and then layer on the economic model later. Okay. Um, and so I, I, mean, I didn't know yeah. this, uh, the, yeah. the history of Peepo. Like so we, had, we had over 250,000 users. I mean, it was a real it was a serious app. Um, and we shut the whole thing down because we said, all right, we, we I'm literally saying, you know, say go down the rabbit hole was I started getting obsessed with, all right, how are we going to create this economic model inside the app and how we enable kind of peer to peer payments that they, with micro transactions and all this stuff. And that like led me into Ethereum and my co-founder, Ben Bolin. And we started like brainstorming, like literally we'd spend weekends just brainstorming how to do this, start diagramming how to create these experiences we wanted like we we had like on this whiteboard it was like if you were to enable every instagram user to be able to you know to to earn by when they post have every like earn money what kind of user experience would you have to enable and the aha then was okay well don't just do this for people build technology to do this for any app mm. and that's when we just basically said you know i basically made this this tough call to say you know let's turn off the app and focus the entire organization towards building the enabling technology. I just felt like it was a much bigger opportunity. 
Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So have any, I, I didn't know this about the history of, yeah. of, of people. Um, so have any of those people from sort of like before, do we see them on the app? Yeah, you know, now? it's really interesting. So it wasn't until a couple of days ago that we even started to let people know from the old people that we existed because we took a different approach this time. Uh, so you know, we, we built all this technology to enable you to integrate these microtransactions into the app. And then we went out and spoke to people to try to figure out what was the, the right features of the app to build. And that led us, uh, we didn't have 30 second videos before. Right? Before the app was uh, just like chat rooms with, like, it was like, you know, kind of almost like a WhatsApp group with the influencer. Mm. Um, and now you know, we layer uh, in the new version of the app that we launched, you know, a couple months ago. It's entirely community driven. Community told us, you know, short form video, real, authentic, and then every like transfers the value. So, we decided also to launch it into the crypto community to start. Mm. And we haven't really marketed to anyone outside the community yet because we wanted to get it right within like a tight knit mm. kind of community and then expand out versus just going really broad. Mm. And it wasn't until a couple of days ago where we actually went out to about 50 of the top influencers, top earners, not earners, but kind of creators in the original people and say, hey, you know, we launched this app. It's mainly used by crypto people now. Do you want to, you know, come on and check it out? And we've had a couple of them join. A couple like of them. Who? So we had this woman who's a food, two foodies in India, one okay, Dubai. I've seen her, yeah. Yeah, and they're like, "Hey, they love this, and I can earn money from it. It's cool." So we'll and so when the time is right, we'll start to push out to the original user base of people. Not yet. Okay. And, and I tell you, that means it takes a lot of patience and kind of. Um, uh, I don't know the right word for it, but like to not just kind of say, "Hey, everyone, join!" You know, yeah, it's like yeah. it's like it's like, but it's, it's not ready yet. You know, it's not ready yet for have everyone join. You don't want, you want to deliver a disappointing experience. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll come back. Yeah, yeah, we'll come yeah. back. James, uh, please please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, exactly. uh, it's funny actually because uh, I guess my journey in terms of coming into the space has been a few few different times where me and Mr. Goldberg have, have crossed paths. So. Um, out of university, I actually co-founded a video discovery product myself. Uh, it was called Swish. Uh, a lot of similarities. We were curating the best of the internet's 30-second video clips. Uh, we did it for about a like year. Like Vine and these sorts of platforms? Yeah, or? it was that time when all of this kind of stuff was going on. Um, initially, the premise was, you know, um, to really focus on quality of video and pull it in from other platforms. Um, you know, focused on, I guess, like the emotions that people really wanted to feel out of them, whether it was like excitement or, or, or amazement or intrigue. So I did that for about a year. Um, yeah, we got to, we got to like a, we got to a decent amount of users, but I think in about a year in, again, we were answering some of the monetization questions. Um, there weren't really answers there. Um, and kind of at the same sort of time, uh, a lot of my friends from university on the startup scene were, you know, getting in really interested in all this blockchain and cryptocurrency stuff. Uh, and it was about that time that I start, I decided to um, stop pursuing this, this video app, which was called Swish. And uh, I set up an educational platform called Light Paper. So the general problem for that was Everyone was super excited about the promise of this technology. So back in what, tail end of 2017, start of 2018, no no one, you know, apart from the super insiders could actually clearly articulate what this stuff was and why, why it was exciting. Mm. So we built like a, a platform just to break down the fundamentals into building blocks, make it simple, kind of the Duolingo for blockchain and cryptocurrency. That went pretty well. Uh, six months in, we had an opportunity to join up um, with some other guys uh, who were building a media property called Decrypt. We chatted with those guys for a little bit, decided to join forces, and um, that's what I'm doing today. So I'm one of the co-founders of Decrypt. We are a media platform covering the space. We do news, we do education, and we do collections. Um, and yeah, that's that's a bit about me. Maybe we can pick up... Uh, you, you guys are growing pretty fast. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we're, we're doing pretty well. We're young. We've been publishing for just over 18 months. We've 20x the size of our audience this year, so that's just over 55,000 readers a year ago to just over 1.1 million. So, um, so we're growing, but I don't know. I think it's important to say that you know along the way we're trying to build a brand which is you know demystifying the space, yeah. pulling back to the conversation a while ago. Um, it's a truth bearer for the site, um, and yeah, you know, one where we're telling compelling stories. I, I, I'm curious because I mean we're. 
both both in media. I mean, different types of media, I, I suppose. But uh, what do you think was what do you think is sort of lacking in this space uh, where you know you felt that decrypt could um, could could fulfill uh, or, or or answer like to sort of like a, a user demand or like an, a community demand. Uh, just in terms of, are you talking about business model in this case, or are you just talking about the no, publication? The, the, con- the content. Yeah, yeah, and our positioning. Um, I can speak to my personal premise. Sure. I think it always comes back to this notion of, um, you know, making this world intelligible, um, helping people to understand what matters, you know, where the promise is, and, you know, by the same token, uh, you know, I think would be naive if we didn't call it out, but you know, there's a lot of scams that have taken place in this space. There's a lot of bad actors, so it is, it's calling those out um, by the same token. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's about highlighting the genuine successes. I think it's about making the, the big ideas um, easy for the outsiders to understand. And I think that's, you know, an important role to play in broader awareness and adoption and, you know, hopefully, um, this space continuing to grow and have an impact, which we all want to see. Hmm. Can you talk about your affiliation with Consensus? Yes, yeah, so happy to talk about that. So we are a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, we are editorially independent and technologically agnostic. Obviously, that's you know a critical pillar for a media company. We need to preserve our integrity. Hmm. So that's something you know that we have really kind of focused on in terms of the foundations and setting ourselves up as a. Um, as a as a media property that's set up to succeed. How do you? What what kind of things have you implemented to to ensure this journalistic integrity? And I guess I guess journalistic integrity is one thing, but the other is um, you know I think I think we can all we can very easily get into sort of uh, into our own bubble. Um, how, how do you ensure that decrypt is really agnostic and, and covering like you know a wide range of technologies from like. Bitcoin to super experimental stuff to like everything in between. Sure. So, I mean, I'm not going to be able to answer in as much fidelity as the people working on the editorial side who have, right. you know, taken a lot of steps to ensure that this is this is in place. Um, I work more with the guys on the tech and product side, um, but I can speak I can speak a little bit in terms yeah. of ensuring ensuring our, our independence. I think if you look back historically at other media publications. Uh, what they used to do is basically draw a line, I guess, between church and state, as it were. And that's, you know, the guys that are actually in the trenches writing the stories and then, you know, the money making part of the business uh, where this content is effectively being monetized. Maybe we'll talk about some of these business models there today, but, you know, it's super important to kind of keep those separate and that, you know, those incentives between the journalists and how the the media company is looking to make money aren't mm. those wires aren't crossed as it were they're 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 not crossed uh, okay <laughs> yeah cool uh, i mean yeah i mean i think i think that it's I mean, i'm not a, i don't consider myself to be a journalist although some people on twitter sometimes <laughs> you know put me in that category um but uh you know I, I think you know of course as a media property that accepts sponsorship um you know, over six years of doing Epicenter, I, I think I've had to make, you know, we've had to make choices yeah. and and we've had to, yeah, be quite diligent. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that there isn't sometimes biases that uh, that, that can, you know, uh, sur- surface. Um, but, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. But so t- today, I mean, I think this conversation should, you know, the reason why I wanted to get you guys in here was to talk a little bit more about... Um, the the sort of challenges and also the opportunities that exist in terms of monetization of sort of media platforms. So, um, you know, both of you run very different media platforms, one being a social media platform, the other being like a, a proper sort of like journalistic media um, uh, company. Uh, but, you know, this question is to the both of you. You know, generally, what what kind of issues and what kind of problems are, are you solving um, with the different things that you're doing? So, like with Pepo, and you know, we'll get to talk about this a little bit more in detail. But the the monetization model that you're implementing in Decrypt. Yeah, I mean, I think from the the Pepo side, uh, you know, look, first first and foremost, we're a technology company, and we built OST technology, Open Simple Token technology to enable 
any application to inject the internet of money into their application. I and mean, that's basically our reason for existence. Uh, and so how do you do that? We enable uh, smart contract wallets to be embedded in any app with the SDK that we've developed and then everything that's needed in order to make sure that those transactions can happen at almost zero cost on kind of scalable layer two chains. And we can go into deeper and deeper as to even lower down the protocol how that works. Uh, and Peepo as an app, uh, you know, halfway through uh, 2019, we we looked at it. We were at a place where we felt like our technology platform was ready to be used by third parties, and we decided not to wait for others to adopt it. It's like you know, you can trying to get people to adopt frontier technology that they, they don't know that they need yet is always complicated, um, and you can take a long time. And we said, what we really need to do is to prove some use cases and show everyone what's possible. Uh, and so we set out to see if we could come up with a use case. Uh, that was worthy of kind of being like a showcase demonstrating to the world what, what our technology was capable of. Uh, and the process we went through was to just start by interviewing lots of people. And we had these, you know, a number of hypotheses early on. And as these things go, some of them, most of them were wrong. Um, but the way we found out was by talking to people. And we started by just talking to people in general about their social media consumption, uh, you know, how they were using sites, let's say like Twitter, YouTube. Uh, we talked to podcasters and kind of what their frustrations and challenges were and how they were you know, monetizing their podcasts. We talked to people about their likes and dislikes with Patreon as an example. We talked to people about things like LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. We went all the way around. And what we uncovered through all these conversations uh, was that a few things stood out. One is we heard that increasingly everyone's a content creator, uh, that every day we're creating tons of content and we're basically uploading that content to these you know, large dominant Web 2.0 platforms who are monetizing our content and our data. Uh, and you know, most people, unless you're Kim Kardashian, are not making much money from it. We heard from a number of folks, podcasters in particular, that services like Patreon um, should work, but don't work as well as they, sh as they should. And if they so, don't shut you down. Yeah, it's yeah. Happened so, to me, so, so, I think. So, so they're not sensor resistant, right? And uh, Totally not. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I know, had a Cosmos newsletter and just like disappeared. No reason. Was no that way a MailChimp to... thing? Um, no. I, I was, it was on Patreon. Oh, on Patreon. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh. Okay, so... <laughs> so I get me started yeah. with Patreon. No, so, so we, we uncovered a lot of things around, so was, we found it was, you know, no matter where people were creating content, you know, with, with an abundance of content, you know, people feel like they're giving up their content for free and not and very struggling to monetize. We found that it's hard for people to stand out and get noticed and recognized. Uh, there's a, the signal versus noise problems continue to, you know, to increase. Uh, and then we found that just the, the payment structure also you know, made in Web 2.0 made a lot of these problems insurmountable. So for instance, you know, pretty much every website app uses Stripe as a payment processor uh, these days. Stripe's fees are 30 cents on every transaction plus 2.8% of the transaction because Visa and MasterCards charge them 25 cents and 2.5%. Um, and, you know, you can't have a one cent or five cent transaction, you know, if you're being charged 30 cents uh, and 2.8%. So it makes microtransactions impossible. So, that's where the internet money comes in and we said okay well we can solve this problem right we can you know, have these transactions be person to person on a blockchain you have no value loss you know you don't have anyone in between <clears throat> collecting rents on it and you don't have to pay the credit card processors as well so there's an economic difference uh and then use the fact that you know tokens are transferring or values transferring to make the experiences richer uh and so for instance in peepo uh you know every token not just earns money you know every every like not just earns money uh but it also impacts the relevance engine, the personalization, uh, cutting down on the noise. Of the, and so, you know, it's like, it, how do you use kind of value in this internet value to actually make experiences better? Yeah, um, I, I was talking to Paul yesterday about this very thing. And I mean, the, the challenge in, in podcasting, and particularly, I think, in the Western world, because I, I mean, from, from what I've heard in my conversations with people in, say, China, for instance, is that the ecosystem is very different. But the, the particular challenge with uh, with sort of Western podcasting is you know these platforms behind you Pod Apple Podcast Spotify yeah, YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of the others um, not none of them or nearly none of them have monetization uh, built in or uh, you know sort of frictionless uh, uh, payments so you know if you, if you want to do any any form of monetization well you've got to lock your users into this other platform like Patreon or or whatever yeah. whatever you choose to go through. And uh, and that's just not the way people consume, yeah. and it, it's it's 
it's not seamless, right? So there, there are platforms to, to that allow you to monetize content. Yeah. But it, but it's not it's not frictionless. Yeah, like, well, let me get there's not like a one click in my podcast player like Spotify where I can just tip you know yeah. whoever I like. Well, let me let me see. So you know, Patreon the podcast is a great example. We went and spoke to must have been dozens of podcasters, and what we found was you that, didn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we well we and it's funny because we didn't even start in crypto. We started yeah. like just talking to people. We talked to people about religion, yeah, sports, yeah. politics, and you know, frankly, we were just crawling Patreon and finding kind of you know. We looked for people, I called them uh, basically the grinders, basically people who were not yet the superstars, but you could tell that they were doing a lot of work to try to make money, but not that well, there yet. They said, let's talk to them because they would have pain points, right? Yeah. So we'd find these people who I'm in like, that category. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and here's what we heard. It was funny. So we, what we heard is that, um, <clears throat> we, we, one is that because the, you call it tipping, but let's say the, the value transfer is not contextual, that mm. most people didn't, don't do it. In fact, we found that only the podcaster super fans end up cl you know, clicking over to Patreon and signing up for a subscription. Yeah. The other thing is the economic model that because of the, <clears throat> the Stripe thing I was talking about with the 2.8% you know, the and 30 cents, that they can't allow you to just kind of give 10 cents right, mm. or 10, 20 cents. So you have to sign up for a subscription, which is usually two or three bucks a month with a recurring subscription that it's hard to cancel. And so the model doesn't lend itself towards this kind of like, wow, I really like what Seb said at minute 30, mm. you know, and just click the button and say, okay, you know, great job, Seb. We also found, frankly, that people hate the word tipping. Um, the mm. whole idea of tipping is not something people associate with online content, but people are very open to showing appreciation with value transfers. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, you know, kind of received tokens of appreciation and earn more than just likes. Right. And so yeah. it's like, and that's, and so, so anyway, so people, my point in all this is people has been developed through a lot of direct user research. I've done personally with our team over a thousand interviews in the last year. We're literally, we spend 30 minutes just talking to people. We try to find pain points. We try to explore and discover kind of what are things that they're trying to get done that can't get done. What are the hacks they're doing to try to get it done and figure out how do we build a better product to make, you know, make it possible for them. Uh, with Peepo, we decided, and this was a, I'd say one of the, the, I guess the hardest, two, two big decisions we made. One was in, in July of last year, um, I think it was July, yeah, we, we were like exploring all these things and we had like all these ideas of like, well, you could create a button that you could like tip people on Instagram with or on Twitter. And we're like, no, we need a place to start. And we kept hearing from people, what we need is one authentic connection to the content creators. So we said, all right, how do we create those authentic connections? That led us to 30 second videos. Because it was like, you have to be yourself in a 30 second video. Um, and then the hardest kind of decision we made up to, leading up to the people launch was, we decided to narrow the focus just to the crypto community to start. And this was really controversial internally. We had so many arguments about this because we had been talking to people, as I said, in like politics and sports and religion and all these different topics. And we're like, we're going to focus just on crypto. And I was like, why? Like, why, why just crypto? And it was like, you know what? Same reason why Airbnb launched in San Francisco before it took over the world. Same reason why, you know, um, you got to pick one market and figure out the density of it, get it right yeah. before it expands. Yeah. The others. one thing. Yeah. And figure out the one thing. Yeah. I'll just keep it on for one second. I, I, it's funny. We also found out early on that crypto itself is not an, it is not a narrow community. There's so many different sub communities inside of crypto. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I think like uh, people have found, you know, at, at least one subset uh, of the crypto community, I think, which is sort of like the DeFi uh, community, there, there seems to be a lot of people like, you know, a lot of people that you see here will be there. Uh, not so much so like other other communities. Um, a lot of DAO people, a lot of DAO people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, activists, I, activists yeah. as well. Uh, and you're starting to see like, uh, yeah, like this sort of new wave of, of people coming on. Like, so this is the whole food blogger, uh, it's sort of foodies, um, which is kind of cool. And it's a, an interesting use case, I think, like for for a video app. Uh, to be able to, yeah. you know, because people take um, <laughs> pictures of their food, um, in, you know, in restaurants and things like that. So I think that it tends, it lends well to the to the application. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about e ecosystem growth and, you know, what what are the what are the levers that allow uh, a, a relatively new ecosystem to grow? Because the, the importance, I think. With any platform is to have is to have network effects. So once again, I'm pointing to the platforms behind us. You know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. You know, if if these pod, if these platforms are successful, well, it's because there's a lot of people on there. And you know, as as a podcaster, for instance, um, I'm glad that I've got a lot of people on Apple Podcasts listening to us or 
on Spotify or wherever. But um, you know, if all of a sudden I, I have to move all my listeners to some, to one platform because that's where I find the sort of marketing features or monetization features that I find, that's an enormous amount of work. Um, in in the case of Peepo, uh, you know. What, what kind of things are you experimenting with here so that people actually start using the platform and then content creators, you know, feel that, well, you know, this is a good platform where I can start creating yeah. content. I mean, I think, I think there's a few things going on here. One is a whole lot of patience and being, trying to say like smart, not fast. Um, now, at the same time, we're moving fast, but like what I mean by smart, not just fast is, you know, we've, we, what we've said is that, um, we need to get if you, you, you we need to get it right for one community and one set of people and then expand out from there rather than trying to go conquer the whole world uh, and I also kind of you know I, I coach our team on patience this kind of basically it's like look I have no idea if people will be the next snapchat right or the next Instagram and the chances are one in a billion of it happening of it having you know hundreds of millions or billions of users but what I do know is that if we get a loyal user base, that is using Peepo, it's gonna attract lots of other companies who want to have that same internet of value technology Im embedded in their apps as well. And you can get that snowball effect of like, you start with Peepo, and then you get to the next you know larger larger app, and the next larger app, the next thing you know, you've got, whether it's a Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok, or saying, okay, how do we use that technology in our application? So it's, for instance, in the, you know, in the podcasting world, you know, we wouldn't be able to go out and sell our technology today to Spotify or Apple. But you find some upstarts in the podcasting space who, you know, they, they, they make some inroads and then, you know, the next level, the next level, the next level. And you, so it's, you can't cut corners. You gotta, you gotta let these flywheels kind of build. Um, now the key for us in terms of like features and people is follow the users um, and make it useful for them. And you know, we need to find, you know, we're constantly searching and the way we search is by having conversations, by talking to people and finding out what does it take to make the app essential? Um, you know, you don't want to be something that people are stacking as like you get just another thing in their toolkit. You want to be something that's one of the first things they think about when they're kind of have something in mind. And what we hit on over the last few weeks is communities. One thing that we found is as opposed to TikTok, which is entertainment kind of bite-sized content where people just want to have like a random bit of delight that they kind of sink into. With Peepo, people were using it for professional, for work, for work kind of uh, related purposes. And with professional work it's like related... The, it's like the, I like to call it the, the, the sort of crypto Twitter, TikTok, steam it. Yeah. Um, but but also like a little a little bit of LinkedIn because yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah, of professional, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and that's something. With, so when you so you say well, so what is a, if it's professional? What does that mean? Well, so you you talk to people. Well, professional is more deliberate. You go searching for a particular topic or a particular community that you're kind of uh, invested in. And so we went deep on, on launching these communities. At Epicenter, you guys, you know, host a community on Peepo. Um, we launched them at Eat Denver, um, and then uh, we've been rolling out. I think it's about 50 communities on Peepo now. And communities allow people to congregate their 30-second videos and conversations around topics uh, to get almost like you know notifications and subscriptions and kind of followers for those topics. Uh, a lot have been event-based, uh, but it's. You know what we're we're doing is we're 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 learning as we as we build the app and we're building it with the users. Mm. And again, as I say, it's like look, I I think we're onto something. I think we're gonna we're gonna show over the next you know you know year that you know Peepo is an app that on its own is very very interesting and gains a huge following and shows that you can you can earn more than just likes. I also think we're very rapidly proving the value of the technology through Peepo. Uh, and I can tell you, we've had dozens of companies that come to us because they see what we built with Peepo and they say, I want that in my app. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I guess when I use the app, I, I, I don't really, um, I don't necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily come to mind that, you know, people could be used in other applications that, you know, you could find, you could find that, 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 that people button, um, you know, in, in a podcast app or on a social network or, or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's about growing an ecosystem and the social media app is just one of those ecosystems. Exactly. And then, you know, and we'll we'll talk we'll talk now a bit, a bit more about what you guys are doing at Decrypt, but um, you know, creating the bridges between those those different communities where you know you might have a, a strong community on over on on Peepo, and then uh, 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 sort of overlapping uh, communities on Decrypt, and then those tokens can can flow also between those platforms. So I want to move now to a little bit more on the uh, uh, sort of the OST model and. Um, what you guys are building on top of OST. So obviously, Peepo is, is built on top of OST. Yeah. Uh, 
what uh, so my question to you james is um what is it in, in the osc technology that you find int- that you found interesting and made you want to build um this uh this this sort of uh community payments platform on top yeah, of decrypt yeah sure um so I, mean, I, I can pick up where where jason left off um and why you know we're one of the companies that are looking to leverage this technology uh so back at back at devcon last year uh, I was at that conference and I saw um, people in action. And I guess for me, it was one of the first times where I've actually looked at what is a web free product and, you know, it doesn't feel or look like a web free product. Yeah. Um, kind of, it, it meets those same user standards that some of the kind of best in class products more broadly in the, in the tech space have been able to hit. So super high level, that's a... Uh, um, how are you guys? How are you guys using using this tech and are able to deliver this user experience um, with blockchain technology? So that was the hook for me. Um, in terms of, I guess, the different component parts, in terms of why it's been really fantastic for us to build on top of it, um, super fast. Uh, it's cheap, and I, I think for us as you know, a, a fairly a fairly small company. Um, <clears throat> This technology that Jason and the guys at RST have been building, um, you know, it's a, it's a toolkit and you can configure that in different ways. Uh, our use case at Decrypt is slightly different. So we are looking at the intersection of us as the publisher, the people that are consuming our content, and then the brands that want to connect with that audience in a way which is completely non-intrusive. So we have a slightly different configuration, but, right. you know, having that toolkit, we can, if we had to build all this stuff ourselves, you know, it would take a long time. It'd be incredibly resource intensive. So, um, you know, the SDKs they offer allow us to, to build quickly. They allow us to iterate and, you know, ultimately answer the problems that um, our users have. So then let's talk about the technology a little bit and the SDK and, and um, how you guys are leveraging that. So what, what are the different components that are part of the, the OST um, sort of toolkit and uh, how, how do you leverage it? Um, I'll give you a high level. Maybe if Jason wants to jump in as well, he can he can give us a he can give us a, a deep dive. Um, so in our particular use case, um, we're doing initially a lot more kind of um, company decrypt being the company to user interactions instead of user to user interactions. Um, so example on people, um, people in the community are sending value to each other. Mm. What we're looking to do is share value between companies and our users. So um, we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later on today, which I'm which I'm excited about. Um, but Decrypt is launching what we're calling Decrypt Seasons. Uh, Decrypt Seasons are seasonal releases of our Decrypt base token, which is brought to you by a brand. So it could be uh, an Epicenter season, it could be a Samsung season, and then in one of these given seasons, there is a limited run of tokens which users can earn. So users earn by reading the content, users earn by engaging with this content, by sharing it. Uh, and then, you know, once they've built, built up a number of these, they can they can cash out for rewards that are valuable to them. Okay. Now, obviously, what the brand's getting from this side is they are co-sponsoring this token and they get to be really immersed into the experience and their brand is front and center every time one of these interactions interactions take place. Can you give me an example? So let's let's say, uh, you know, you have a, an exchange you know, that, that wants to sponsor one of these seasons. Um, what what are the kinds of interactions that uh, would uh, allow readers or users of the platform to to uh, get those tokens? And where where would the sponsor um, find sort of yeah, like the features. connection? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think one thing just to kind of kick this off is I think Web3 is teaching a lot of people that their attention actually has value. I think users are becoming a lot more cognizant of that. You know, uh, it's a bit of a hangover from all of these huge Web2 monopolies that have, you know, been able to make millions, billions of dollars from, um, you know, using user information and, and, and data. So I think, you know, we're trying to play a small part in kind of making a bit more of a, having a system with a bit more parity uh, where users are rewarded from that. So your question, example, um, we're keeping it simple to begin with. Let's say our users are reading an article on 
the Epicenter podcast or they're reading an article talking about um, what the guys at Pipo are doing. They read the article. Once they read the article, they get an option to be able to complete it. As soon as they complete that, that given piece, they'll get a reaction. They'll let the know user how they felt about that. So that's, this piece was great. This piece is bearish. This piece is bullish. And then as soon as they've completed it, as a reward for them completing and obviously the investing their time and attention in this content, they will instantly using the OST tech we've been talked about, they'll get sent one of these co-branded one of these co-branded tokens. They'll add to their wallet, and then you'll see in the wallet that they have one of these one of these co-branded tokens brought to you by the by the brand partner for that particular season. Okay. And then all those tokens roll up to the decrypt tokens. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I, I can talk a little about the enabling technology that makes that possible. Okay. Is that, is it good? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so OST is a layer two Ethereum smart contract solution, uh, and so uh, what we what we do basically is we enable brands like Decrypt to deploy tokens on layer two Ethereum chains. Uh, the value of those tokens are uh, determined by locking value in contracts on layer one. Uh, so let's say you could take. Any ERC20 token it could be ETH, it could be DAI, whatever it is, and use it as the base for creating the token on layer two. And then you basically create a mapping of, let's say, one to one and so whatever, or one to 10, whatever you want the exchange rate to be, but that gets fixed in the smart contract so that whoever receives the layer two tokens, they know the value of that token is based on what's ever in layer one. Um, and so, for instance, in the Peepo app, you have a one to one mapping of Peepo to the OST token. Um, and OST, you know, most recently trades in the range of, you know, let's say 0.9 cents to 1.5 cents and users see the fluctuation of that. Um, but you could also have it ba the backing of the token on the layer two could also be backed by a stable coin like DAI or USDC if you wanted to. Okay, so you, for instance, like your, you know, the decrypt token could be backed by DAI instead of the OST Correct. so that you would have like a stable value. Entirely up to them. We're, we're Interesting. agnostic to that. Okay, yeah. so then they, they you know, then the, 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 the platform would provide that, that liquidity. Correct. Yeah. In the smart contract. Correct, exactly. And so, and what this does is it, it creates a regulatory compliance solution um, that also enables the UX that we that we enable. So, the regulatory compliance is that the decrypt token has no secondary market; it can't be traded on exchanges. Its only value is derived by what's backing it in, in, in the kind of what's what's being staked on layer one. Um, and so, technically, an owner of, say, a decrypt token, if it was backed by DAI, and let's say if it was one to one, would say, okay, I know this token is worth a dollar because there's DAI in a contract that backs that. And if they ever want to call on that, they could. Although the in-app experience for redemption we've created is more compliant, which is how do you cash out for gift cards, which is part of the SDK that we provide. Same thing as in Peepo. Yeah. Um, and. And all that is part of you know delivering a solution that actually speaks to what users want and need versus trying to just do what is the best optimal solution that you might have, say, for, you know, a couple of years from now, which would be you know user can just use their own key, you know their own their own keys and just cash out for whatever they want, let's say, right? But for now, gift cards work really, really well. Um, so the the next part of the enabling technology is that our SDK, which we were talking about, uh, enables brands like Decrypt to embed a smart contract wallet, basically have a smart contract wallet that every one of their users can, can get. And we deploy a number of smart contracts for uh, on behalf of every user on the layer two chains, uh, including uh, basically a what's called a token holder address, which is where the users uh, tokens live and they can access that from multiple devices. Uh, a recovery contract which allows them to recover using a six digit pin with a delayed recovery module. And all this is kind of the blockchain under the scenes, you know, you know, lower down than any user really needs to know about that makes these, you know, basically almost zero cost token transfers possible. Okay, interesting. I, I I wasn't aware yeah. that there was like you could actually do like this backing with die and like yeah. that you know because you know, I mean ultimately you could create a token that's worth like a penny for instance yeah yeah for sure um and and have it be backed by die now the at the moment though you know these tokens you can use them in in people to buy gift cards yep. um. So, but that's a regulatory uh, yeah, essentially the issue at the moment? Yeah, so, so our approach has been, I call land and expand versus go for the optimal. And land and expand is, you know, like, rather than trying to spend the next, you know, so let's say, several years 
getting regulatory clearance to do the entire uh, optimal solution, which would be, let's say, user can move whatever money they want into an app like Peepo and then you know, cash out any way they want, whether it's you know, dollars or crypto or the bank account, whatever it is. We said, let's, let's get in the app store first with something that is regulatory compliant and Apple compliant. Which is a, a challenge in itself, I, yeah, believe, exactly. I think. Yeah. yeah, and so it was the first uh, crypto app approved by Apple. Actually, the conversation there was really funny because we, we had our lawyers were cool with what we, you know, basically the solution that we implemented because we architected with them for over, I guess, a year's worth of work with them. We brought it to Apple and Apple's like, hmm, interesting, but we're not the law, we're Apple. So we want to talk to you about this and they dug into it and then we, we got their clearance. And But basically what I'm getting at here is- talk to Apple? Like, yeah, <laughs> is yeah, there yeah, like yeah. a number you call? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you actually what happened. I was, I was in Osaka at, at DEF CON and we really wanted to move the app out of test flight. And our lawyers were like, we're clear, we're good. And, it's like, and the, the clearance I'm talking about here is basically we implemented a solution where you can you can you can't you can you basically can you can buy more tokens using Apple Pay and Google Pay, so using their established means, so relying on them to be the payment processor, and then cashing out for anything that's a store of value, like a gift card. Uh, that store that could be a, an Amazon Airbnb gift card. It also could be an NFT. It could be you know, purchasing something, a, a domain or whatever it might be. Mm. Anything that's a store of value, you don't need money transmission license for. For uh, um, money transmitter license. Okay. Right. And right. so we got our lawyer signed up for it, and then I was like, all right, let's let's get this thing to into the App Store. Let's show during DevCon that we actually can get this live in the App Store. So we submitted this to Apple with a note basically saying, um, you know, we want to be first. We want to show that this is possible to have a crypto powered in app, you know, blah, blah, blah. I sent them all the legal opinions. I sent a back channel, some folks I knew at Apple said, try to get someone that we can get attention on this. And they responded immediately. It was amazing. We had a, um, a, a, a woman on the app review team. I think she was a lawyer. I don't know for certain, but based on her question, I think she was. She said, let's get on some calls. I was talking to her three to four in the morning in Osaka time back in Cupertino where she was. And we went through three rounds of review and kind of some revisions and they approved the app. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to bring it back to you, uh, James. And what's what I mean, when, when you were speaking with advertisers, sponsors uh, on the platform, what's, you know, how, what's that conversation look like? Uh, where traditionally you're, you're telling them like, hey, you know, buy this ad space or, or maybe you're not even having that conversation because you're going through some, uh, some ad marketplace. Um, how does that conversation now change that now that you, you, know, you guys are doing this, um, this uh, co-branded token? Yeah. So I think it's uh, you know, important to flag that I think these business models tend to move a lot more slowly than the technology itself. Um, you guys probably both 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 experienced that, and the platforms and the monetization methods that some of these advertisers are used to are, you know, what's been existing for a while. So, this is your ad exchanges. This is your banner ads. These are your sponsorships that you might put on a product like a podcast. They're business models which have been kind of established for a little while, um, and that you know these ad buyers are familiar with. So, you know, I do think, um, and this relates to what Jason's been saying and, you know, looking for that beachhead market, the conversations that we're trying to have are with companies that are, you know, aware that they think there's a better way, that these business models are slightly out of date. They have, you know, a larger experimental ad, ad budget. Mm. Um, let us say, um, and that they're, they're willing to, you know, try things which are not, totally unfamiliar with what we've seen before um but you know introduce you know a bit of novel technology um in our case and are happy to work with us and and, and we play out those experiments mm. i mean i think you know similar to how we're starting people in the crypto community and building out from there i mean i i would see like you, know, you get some pretty awesome crypto brands to um, and crypto native companies to prove some use cases that you can then build out and take that to mainstream companies and they'll see the results first rather than just being sold on something that's pie in the sky. Very similar. Yeah. Hmm. Um, one thing I just wanted to note, like, you know, nothing that I've mentioned at all in terms of you know, monetization, whereas James has in terms of you know, his model, is at all based on, let's say, validator economics or, you know, kind of ceiling transactions on a blockchain or number go up. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize uh, that that aspect of it. That you know, there's this er this kind of these 
it's almost like the easy in crypto, easy ways to just go to try to appeal towards, you know, if enough people buy, it'll create demand that'll increase the prices and everyone will make money. And I think, you know, having, you know, a, a, these apps can't be just all kind of everyone's going to make money through kind of usage and network kind of fees, that there needs to be more utility to them. Um, and uh, it's a, I think it's an important distinction because I think you know, in terms of creating this internet of value, uh, I think the first use case that we have today, mostly around DeFi, is around kind of, let's say, upending the banking system um, and or maybe introducing that there could be an alternative form of banking or kind of, you know, kind of finance. The actual kind of injection of kind of what does that mean for applications and products and you know whole new monetization models? We've yet to see that yet, but I don't want to just fall back on well number go up. Mm. Yeah. Now, do you foresee any? I mean, and this this question is for the both of you, but do, do you foresee uh, um, uh, sort of bridges between uh, the 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 decrypt token, the, the Pepo token, and DeFi? You know, what are some of the interesting things that uh, you, maybe you're brainstorming about? Well, I'll, I'll speak from the, on the on the people side, and actually also from the OST technology side. Is so as part of the announcement we're doing today is we're also announcing the OST Redemption Store SDK. So today we're powering the store inside of Peepo where you can cash out for Amazon, uh, Airbnb, Uber, gift cards. We also added um, Unstoppable Dom Domains, which is crypto domain site uh, today as well. And we're pro providing that also now in an SDK. So the folks at Decrypt are able to basically, we, we power the cash out options for them. They don't have to build that themselves either. Mm -hmm. um, now, next steps, we want to enable kind of crossover between the tokens. So you could, let's say you could take your your people coins and convert them to decrypt coins if you wanted to or to other partners we have um and you know it's like you know what we're looking for is just more ways to create this interoperability and kind of network effects across across the system and now in terms of where we go with that over time we want to enable people to take more control over what's in their wallets um today the the wallet themselves is completely self custody. So we nor decrypt uh, nor any of our other partners have any way of reaching into a user's wallet and taking their tokens or expiring them. Um, it's you earn it, you own it. Uh, now the next step is we want people who are maybe more crypto savvy to be able to say, okay, I'd like to participate in DeFi through that, or I would like to, um, you know, maybe you know convert some of my tokens into crypto uh, or into other you know other things they might want to do with their tokens um, we're taking an incremental step-by-step -step approach to that like it's like you know the number one reason why people aren't let's say adopting people faster is not that right now mm. it's you know how do they get more value from the video format or whatever right. it is right and so so you've got to work on these things uh, we prioritize them based on user and in, user interest yeah I mean I can add to that I mean I think it's the kind of holy grail of this space that there's just this kind of seamless fluid transfer of value which can go kind of everywhere and anywhere um we're excited to see the interoperability options um continue to evolve you know with ost but also you know all these great technology companies in this space um i can just second what jason said and that's uh you know you've got to start somewhere it's almost like Maslow's user hierarchy of <laughs> needs and i think it's looking to provide utility here and now and that interoperability uh, and users completing the loop and getting value from these systems. Um, you know, there's things that we can do before looking at, you know, where these tokens can be sent, exchanged and used elsewhere. Yeah. Now, just let me say, like, if you were to say, like, if we were to say to users and people, you know, lock up your tokens for a period of time and earn interest um, on them so you can't cash them out during that time. Yeah, you could, you right. could totally do that, right? Like, I mean, because you're not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tipping out a lot of tokens, but a lot of them could be locked in DeFi, you know? Uh, users, users could do that. We'd, we'd want to make sure that, uh, you know, look, we're an app in the app store. So we need to, we, 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 we have a higher God. Her name, her, her name is Apple, right? And so we have to make sure we do such, such things in a compliant manner. And you know, today our wallet is self custody, and we don't want to move to us being the custodian. So the user, we'd have to find a really slick UX for the user to understand what what she's doing, and for her to decide, okay, I'm now defying my tokens and getting interest on it. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's you know, they need to say, well, how am I earning eight percent interest from my keeping my tokens and people? That that could be an interesting way to educate people on why people are willing to borrow die and at such high rates. But you know, one step at a time. That would be really cool. I mean, I think that's like a really interesting way to get people, just regular people, uh, sort of like in, into DeFi and sort of understanding the, the, the mechanics of Who's DeFi. Who's on the other side of that 8% trade? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, with regards to the SDK, 
uh, I, I think one of the things that has been on my mind recently, uh, we, so we recently did an episode with uh, Itamal Lustris of Argent. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You're familiar with Argent. You know, they build a great wallet. And you know, I think a lot of the technology um, that that sits behind Argent, specifically with regards to the the, 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 the wallet and sort of the, the multi-sig wallet, et cetera, it's probably quite similar to, to that of, of, uh, OST, of, of yeah. OST. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, you know, for, for an app like theirs, they're controlling the technology, but they're all, they also, uh, you know, leverage basically, basically have control over the entire user interface. Now, for something like OST, you guys are a technology provider. Um, you you know, you're providing technology at the base layer, but you're not, you're not necessarily like sitting in, in design workshops with the client, uh, sort of coaching them on what are the user experience best practices around um, things yeah, like are, actually. Oh, maybe you are <laughs> but like you know if you want to scale it's yeah. funny you say that Sam <laughs> no but I mean I, I just think like yeah. hypothetically if you if you want to scale you're you know you're providing an API anybody can use it now you know for 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 a company like Decrypt that's building this this user interface you know there's a lot of really new and novel concepts in there one of which is um, recovery. So, you know, if you take something like recovery, I, I don't know if OSD has this at the moment, but yeah. pre I presume you could have it where you would have maybe like one of your people friends can can help you recover your yeah. wallet. How do we create good user experience practices? Because it goes beyond just the technology. There's really, yeah. we need to create UX standards around things like recovery, key storage, you know, where your keys are stored, how you yeah. recover them. And it's yeah. not super clear. So a couple things to unpack here. So this is a really great question. Um, the first is that, uh, so for huge admirers and fans and close to the guys at Argent, a really great team. Yeah. Argent took the path awesome of, yeah. yeah, they took the path of being a standalone wallet. And our kind of ethos at OST was to be ingredient technology. Uh, and so while they're under the, you know, like a lot of what's makes it, OSC technology possible has some commonalities with Argent. They wanted to be a wallet product where people use the wallet. And we said, we want to enable thousands of wallet products to be within apps using our technology. Just a different approach to a similar kind of you know, problem to solve. We said, let's go to folks who already have distribution like Decrypt and others, rather than us trying to gain you know, wallet downloads. And our also kind of philosophy there is that the wallet, we call it like wallet as a platform, that uh, wallet is not an app, wallet is just a, a basically, wallet's a number where your tokens are held and that can be embedded into all sorts of different places you know it's, it's a contract um, now in terms of the SDK itself and this is really important we have created the OST wallet SDK in such a way that all of the kind of the core functionality of the wallet and the user experience around uh, adding multiple devices, uh, initiating recovery, going through the recovery process, uh, all of that is powered by the SDK in such a way where um, it's available on iOS and Android and React Native in such a way where the team at Decrypt, they don't need to, for that part of their application, they don't need to adjust any of the UI at all. So we basically, it's like everything that's, it's in several layers of the wallet functionality, they can basically just kind of take this and just like plop it right into their application. Uh, and so, and we've optimized that UX based on our user research and feedback okay. um, so that they don't need to write any of that. I think, yeah, I mean, I can add to that. Um, like zooming out, when we started to see UX coming out of the dawn of the internet, there are all these weird elements that people haven't seen before, like this is a form and I need to enter my information into a form. And obviously there's been loads of research and best practices that have emerged out of years these of new, research. yeah, like years. years and years of research. People are still figuring out forms. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I mean, I think that all is to say that, you know, we're seeing these new patterns. We're seeing like a users being able to re recover their keys and, over time, I think the more and more people uh, work in this space, the more and more people use this technology, we see these best practices emerge. Um, and, you know, from our side, I think implementing these patterns starts with boring as it sounds. That's good documentation. That's mm. good examples of what to follow. Um, yeah. And, you know, in terms of these, these recovery patterns and the other patterns that are more novel to Web3, um, you know, being able to follow the the practices that OST put out has been has been great. Yeah, interesting example of this. Like, so 
when we when we created the wallet recovery module for the OST wallet SDK, we did this from two fronts. One is we started with user research and we put we call paper testing. We put different options in front of people and we saw where they succeeded and where they failed. And these are mainstream users we started with, not with kind of say crypto savvy people. And what we found was that a six digit pin was the maximum that someone was able to remember again and again and again. Um, and so, you know, obviously writing down 12 words would be more optimal, but most people don't, won't do it. You obviously can't remember 12 words. Uh, and, but six digits was something that every people remembered every single time. And so we then went to our security experts and said, okay, we need to find a way to enable a six digit wallet recovery from smart contract to be part of our wallet SDK. So we started with the experience and then we reverse engineered back to the technology and then we figured out a way to make a six digit pin recovery from smart contract. Now we also tested what you mentioned, social recovery and it failed miserably. Right. And so it's one of these concepts where I think a lot of us, you know, crypto nerds, like we think, oh, it'd be great. You can ask three of your friends to help you recover from smart contract. Your friends don't want to help you do that. And you don't want it either. Like we find with most people, they actually don't, they don't get it. That it's, it's not, it's not a viable solution. And so it's, it's okay. The fact that from a security standpoint, it would work, but it doesn't necessarily mean people are going to do it. So we focus on things that people actually use. Interesting. How do you overcome the the challenges, I guess, that are linked? I mean, specifically with regards to the the, the, decrypt, the decrypt token. Um, how do you overcome the challenges of sort of civil attacks? Um, I mean, with, with I don't want to say it's harder on on people, but you know, on people, you need to have like a Twitter account. You need to. It's like on an app. It's but you know, with 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 a web browser, it's maybe easier to automate uh, sort of identity creations and 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 getting people to yeah. sort of like sure so um, that sort of thing. to begin with we're launching on an app security is obviously significantly easier on an app it's much more it's easier to exploit on the web yeah uh, looking to expand and expand into the web later but first and foremost we're releasing the decrypt app where we're introducing um, these tokens and our seasons I think when we're looking from a token design point of view, when we're looking at all these different actions and uh, incentivizing those actions, you've got to flip the coin and be like, okay, what's a malicious user going to actually do here to try and exploit this? Mm. So um, to start off with, confirming that a user has read an article, our kind of mechanic there to prevent, you know, someone building some clever bot that's going to be reading thousands of articles a day and absolutely destroying our token reserve. Um, that's uh, We put a sensible daily cap on the number of tokens that a reader can use. And we also attach a sensible kind of reading speed to our articles. So someone who's a really quick reader, what does that look like in terms of words per minute? And we have a timeout. So that's just an example of how we're thinking about uh, preventing abuse on that particular action. But the same applies to sharing and being able to validate that. I think, you know, there's there's simple things you can do to guard against these kind of um, malicious actors. Yeah. The best thing is put stuff out there also and just, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll think that you come up with everything and then just watch the users and, and fill the holes. Because yeah. users will find them and it's like, it's okay. These apps right now are not completely decentralized from the redemption standpoint. Uh, and so, you know, as I said, the user has a self-custody wallet, it's a smart contract wallet, they own their own keys, you know, we can't take money from them. But we do play a role right now in the cash out. Um, and so there's always this kind of this safety net that, well, if someone goes to cash out and you saw that they were a malicious actor, we don't have to basically honor the cash out in that in that instance. Yeah. Um, now, if they did something that was our mistake that allowed them to, you know, to accumulate lots of tokens that, you know, then we should let them let them keep what they earn. What's the future? Uh, what does the future of of, uh, of media uh, and, and tokens look like? I mean, this is this is a question that uh, you know, sort of like um, I've carried with me for for the last six over six years of doing a podcast. Is um, you know what are the new models look like, and and where where is this space going to go? And I think there's been a lot of experimentation. I mean, even even in the early days of Epicenter, you know, we're part of the LTB network, and and. Uh, and there were some early, early experimentations there, even before Ethereum uh, on Counterparty um, with the LTB token. Uh, you know, other platforms have done this, like Steam it. And um, okay, let's not talk about the whole drama there. But um, 
you know, what, what's what's the future here and where are we going to see the most innovation come from? Yeah. I mean, look, my perspective on this is that we're at the very beginning days of injecting the Internet of Money into app, you know, applications, uh, websites and enabling uh, all new sorts of business models that are going to be aided by the fact that anything that you can do, anywhere you can transfer a piece of data or there's an API call or any kind of action a user can take online, whether it's a five-star review, um, a high five, an emoji, whatever it might be, could have value attached to it. And that can have impact on consumer experiences, but also on business models. Uh, and it can start to create new models of how individuals can monetize um, their data, their content, et cetera. And I think it's going to be, it's going to take longer at first than I think people wish to materialize. When it does, people are going to be like, whoa, where did that come from? It's huge. It's everywhere. And I think we're at right now is like, we're at least up to bat, right? So like, you know, it's like, I think, you know, six months ago, it was like, will this ever happen? At least now we're in the game. Right? And I think now that we're in the game, we're going to start to see some things moving pretty fast. So you think about DeFi as an example, like, you know, a year ago, no one was talking about DeFi. And suddenly it's everywhere. Right. And we're at this like the beginnings of these kernels of like Internet of value kind of percolating across. And it's going to be one app and the next app, the next app. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, like someone will create the next Snapchat or Instagram or something. Maybe one, maybe the next media site or whatever it might be. That'll be completely, you know, token powered. And people are like a whole new business model has you know, been, been invented here. Oh, I think it's a very good question. I think <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that one, Seb. I think um, ultimately all of these businesses um, largely shaped by the business models that that emerge. You know, we've seen that the start of the internet and media companies being completely up upended. We've seen that with the rise of social media. Um, you know, I'm personally keeping my eye on this, and I'm really excited to what Jason's alluding to. And you know, if this kind of elusive business model emerges from Web3. I think people are aware that, you know, there's certainly a different toolkit now where we can start, you know, building um, a new business model. But um, what I come back to is just the notion of these Web3 tools being programmable trust and that's, uh, you know, being able to good design good incentives um, between, between different groups and, you know, hopefully a system which is... Um, there's more equ equanimity between between the parties, um, so I don't know, but I'm I'm excited to find out. Well, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing where this uh, where this goes, and I'll be following it very closely because it's it's um it's a topic that's very very near to me, and and where I'm I'm really interested in seeing so the progression and you know I mean with Epicenter uh, this could also be perhaps an area of experimentation um, and um, yeah who knows I mean we could. Most certainly burned some about some more <laughs> over <laughs> beers or something. Thanks, guys, for being on the podcast. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Seb.